always in the danger if you say I work in career guidance of the person you're talking to saying when I was at school I had careers advice and it was awful. Um, I like the term career development because it it emphasizes that development and process. I do think career guidance is a process and as such it, it should be a lifelong process. Career guidance or career development isn't just for young people, it's for adults and it should be there throughout our working lives as something we can all access when we need it. It's a bit unrealistic to enter a career at the age of 18 or 19 and expect to do that throughout the whole of one's working life. It's up to all of us, whatever our backgrounds, to plan and develop those career management skills that will see and support us throughout our working lives. Thank you for joining me in Season 2 of Hoda's Career Info, your career literacy program. I am Hoda, your host and supporter of all your career learning needs. I look forward to another season of Career Chats with inspirational guests and insightful feedback from you, the audience. Ready to meet this week's guest? My guest, Jan Ellis, has worked in the career development sector for almost 40 years, both as a practitioner and a senior manager. In her early career, she worked as a career advisor with young people and adults in the UK. In the 1990s, she was part of the SMT at VT Careers Management. She was responsible for business development, marketing, and the career software and publishing company Life Skills. In the early 2000s, she established her own business and later led marketing and all aspects of business development at the Institute of Careers Guidance. In 2013, Jan was appointed as the first CEO of the Career Development Institute, the UK-wide professional body for the career development sector. Committed to private and public partnerships, as well as lifelong career guidance, Jan joined Kudos Education in June 2021. Please don't hesitate to share what you learned from my chat with Jan Ellis and to let me know what you think. Welcome to Huda's Kidding Info. I am thrilled today to have you, Jan Alice, as my guest all the way from the UK uh, in this episode. I'm hoping you, we will get a chance to hear from you and hear about 40 years of experience in our short chat. And uh, right away, um, your background it is loaded with experiences in the career guidance field. You've supported the career development field in many ways. And I was happy to see on your website that it also included uh, starting your own business. Um, but do you mind sharing with the audience some of your uh, moments and highlights? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you. Very first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, 40 years makes me feel pretty old, but um, I have been around in the career guidance sector for a long time now, I suppose because I am passionate about the value of career guidance and have been since um, I left university. My, my first experience actually was not particularly good of career guidance, and that's partly why I became a careers advisor, I think, because when I left university, I went to visit the university careers service. Um, and I sort of thought I liked the job. I liked the look of what they did. It seemed very nice, a good way of marrying together an interest in education and an interest in business and employment. Um, and I thought a good use of my time might be to take a year off and learn about lots of jobs because I feared that I couldn't help anybody if I hadn't actually experienced different types of work myself. So I spent a year working in hospitality and catering, working behind a bar, working in an office, working as a wages clerk, um, working in a department store for a while, doing lots of different jobs because I felt I needed to actually have some of that experience myself if I was ever going to advise others. 
And then I went and had another careers interview uh, in my hometown. And I can remember this interview very clearly because the person that was interviewing me, I felt was asking lots of very interesting questions, but she wasn't really getting to the the, the real what was it about that I wanted to do and she was very um believing in what I said she didn't really challenge me to explain more about my thoughts um and I really that's what confirmed to me actually that I'd like to be a careers advisor because I just thought you're not really asking me the right questions in the right way and maybe I could do this job and and that's what I should be doing so that's really how I started down the trail of, of being a careers advisor uh, was by actually going through the process and feeling that actually maybe I could do it at least as well as the person that was um, actually interviewing me then and so I did a, a one-year postgraduate course which you could do in England at the time um, in a college south of London, which was again different for me because I lived in the north of the country. Um, and my first job was working in the Midlands in England um, in, in an area that's not particularly well off. It's, it's quite deprived. And the choices for young people in those days were they either went and worked in a coal field, in a coal mine underground, or in a um, a hosiery mill making knitwear, machine knitwear, really, for big companies. And that was quite an eye-opening experience because the choices that the individuals I met had were very limited. They were limited by the opportunity structure around them. And they were limited by tradition and culture of their parents. Their parents or their fathers, in the case of the guys, had been down and worked in the mines and therefore they felt they should and couldn't see any way out of the situation. And even if they wanted to, at 16, 17, they didn't have the confidence to try something completely new and different. Um, and from working in the north of England, I then moved to the south where it was completely different. There were lots of jobs. And I made a decision I wanted to work with um, students that had a chance of really getting on in life and, and going to university. And I specialised in that for three years. And that was completely different. And I spent a lot of time travelling around, visiting different universities and giving a guidance to students that really had a, a future uh, in the sense that they were the, the young up and coming things for tomorrow. I really enjoyed that work. And from that, I moved into adult guidance. Um, I always thought I didn't want to do adult guidance. But what I really liked about working with adults was that they were so grateful for the support that you could give them. And they always said thank you. Young people don't say thank you. <laughs> but the adults were really uh, very grateful for the support that we could give them. And I enjoyed that work a lot. But then after that role, uh, my job took me up the slippery ladder of management. And as you do more management activity, you see you see clients less, really. And I went on to become a, a senior manager in a big careers company. Um, and I specialised in in marketing, publishing, IT um, and psychometric assessment of um, young people and adults using career software. So my, my career took a, a change away from working with individuals to really managing the careers business and aspects of the careers business. And I did that for a, a number of years until about 2009 when I was made redundant, which was a great salutary experience for me, very painful experience. Um, but that's what led me to become self-employed and set up my own business, not wanting to ever be in that position again when someone would, you know, tell me that my services were no longer required. So I worked um, for myself in the career sector, doing a lot of um, bid writing and business development for career companies, which I enjoyed up to a point, but found quite isolating and a lonely existence. It's also a bit feast and famine. When you have lots of work to do, you've really got your head down and you could be working five and six and seven days a week. And then there'd be lots of periods where you didn't have a lot of work on. So I, I didn't really like that all or nothing of, of being self-employed. But I was invited um, in 2009 to do some work for a professional body in England that um, actually sacked its manager at the time and invited me to come in and sort out the mess. 
which I did. And that got me involved in the professional development of career professionals. Um, and so when in the UK, uh, one single professional body was established that covered all of the profession, um, I saw the job advertised to be the chief executive of that applied and that was my substantive role for the last eight years. It's only recently in the last two months that I've left that role um, and, and moved into something else. So in summary, really, I've worked in the public sector. I've worked for myself as self-employed and I've worked in the private sector. And I can honestly say there are advantages to all three and disadvantages. I really liked the... Um, support network around me in the public sector but very aware that it's not funded as well as it might be training and development opportunities were great but there were also lots of hoops and hurdles you'd have to go through to make change to effect change working in the private sector um, for myself as a, a self-employed person okay i had control of the uh, many aspects of business but i found that quite isolating so pros and cons for that. And finally, working in the private sector, I've really enjoyed because I think you have to have a good understanding of economics and business, but also career development. And it's a way of blending the two together. But perhaps we'll unpick more of that during the uh, interview and discussion. Yes, yes, we will for sure. And I just have to say, I love how you experienced a bit of everything <laughs> uh, and uh, now are able to share this with everyone listening and watching this. So I appreciate that. And uh, wow, a great experience, this uh, sticking this one field and because many come from different fields to this career yeah. development field. And so yours is definitely unique in that. Uh, before we move on into more details, I do have to do what I always do in the show is uh, asking you to share a personal definition of a career term. And um, you chose two, which is perfect. And uh, career guidance and career development. I cannot wait to hear your um, input and definitions of these terms. I think my definitions of analysis of these terms is going to be very influenced by the way I've been trained and the environment in which I work within the UK. But I see career guidance as a process. It's a, a support service, a personal service um, associated with a non-directive approach to counselling, really there to support individuals to achieve their goals. Um, broadening aspirations, supporting individuals, which has a knock on effect of helping economies to grow um, and societies to become fairer. So that's, that's my definition, really, of career guidance. I see it as strengthening the relationship between education, skills and employment. My second definition um, uh, around is around career development, which is a term that's been more used in the UK because career guidance is value loaded and it has some connotations in the UK that we would like to leave behind, but it's, it's rather dogged by negative perceptions. You're always in the danger if you say, I work in career guidance, of the person you're talking to saying, when I was at school, I had careers advice and it was awful. Or my careers advisor told me to become X, which was utterly unsuitable for me. So career guidance is a bit value loaded in the UK. And it's a term that sometimes we find it meets opposition and it creates perceptions in people's minds that we were rather weren't there. So we often use the term career development instead of career guidance. I like to think I'm a career development professional. Um, and, and it's interesting that I'm also part of an international group, a peak body group, and we had a meeting only this week and we were talking to colleagues in New Zealand who are also using the term career development professional going forward. So I'm wondering if this is something that, that's going to catch on in the global career guidance and development community. Um, I like the term career development because it, it emphasizes that development and process. I do think career guidance is a process, 
Um, and as such, it, it should be a lifelong process. I'm a big believer in lifelong career development and lifelong learning uh, and an all age guidance and all age uh, emphasis, really, that it's not a career guidance or career development isn't just for young people. It's for adults and it should be there throughout our working lives as something we can all access when we need it. So to some extent, the terms are interchangeable. And I, I'm making reference, I suppose, to a position in the UK that career guidance sometimes has negative connotations because of people's own experiences. And so we're trying to use the term career development. And certainly within the profession, we refer to ourselves as career development professionals rather than career guidance professionals. So a lifelong service, really, supporting people to achieve their goals and ambitions. But it has a great value to society as well because of the influence it has in supporting economies to grow and societies to become fairer. I love how you combine career guidance with career development. And you're right, when I think of career guidance, I'm thinking of high school. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, career development is, is career guidance. We are using career development as well in Canada a lot. I don't know the reason if it's to stay away from career guidance, but it's still used in schools. And so that would be interesting for me to look up and see what's happening. I do identify as a career development professional and you know, many of uh, it's the same skills, isn't it? We're using the same skills, but the, the terminology of guidance is more used with young people. But I think when you're talking to adults, you're probably talking more in a coaching way too around career development um, and developing your skills and moving to the next role. But it's, it's all a continuum, really. Yes, and, and lifelong, as you mentioned. Yes. It's so important oh, to keep that key Really word. important for me that it is a lifelong process and an all age process. It's not just something for young people. It should be accessible throughout your, your life. Absolutely. Uh, from our chat, I gathered that you are a realist in your approach to career guidance. And uh, I am gonna use the hair stylist um, example that we talked about uh, in that if I were a client back in the day when you're doing the one-on-one -on -one services and I came to you and I said Jan I really want to be a hairstylist how would you suggest I approach this career path in a market that is saturated with hairstylists and it could be any other career I think it's a, it's a very difficult one but I would firmly I'm of the firm belief that we shouldn't be giving career guidance in a vacuum there are many theories of career guidance, aren't there, that we all get taught as part of our training. And, and when I was going through that training, one of the ones that stuck in my mind a lot was one that referred to the opportunity structure. So you can't give career guidance in a vacuum. I think that's sometimes what gives career guidance practitioners or careers advisors a bad name because they go along with what a young person or an adult is saying they want to do without sufficiently challenging it or providing the realism as to what the opportunity structure is like. So for the example of a hairdresser or a hairstylist, um, it, it, I would want to be honest with the client, which might be a bit challenging and scary, but the reality is in my high street, there are tens of hairdressers and it's a highly competitive area to go into. And perhaps it's a good idea to think about other careers as well, where you could use the skills and the things that interest you about being a hairstylist in a slightly different way, because the market is saturated with hairstylists um, and the job opportunities are relatively limited. So think what it is about that hairstylist role that you really like, and let's look at how we could use those skills and look at the jobs that might be in demand, both now and in the future, using some of the same skills. So I think as a, as a career professional, we owe it to our clients to be honest and realistic around job opportunities and the labour market structure. And giving informed guidance is really important, I think. It's highly ethical and very unethical not to do that. 
I appreciate you taking me on in this example, because today, as you mentioned in your background, you're taking on bigger roles, ones that involve bigger pictures. Uh, and so your recent positions are now stepping away from that one-on-one -on -one services that I provide. So I do appreciate that. But uh, there is a term trending, the new economy right now. Um, I'd like to pick your brain. What are your thoughts on it? Because it is believed, to, or it's always it's being said that it is the driving force of economic growth and productivity. And I'd love your thoughts on that term. I think some of the talk about um, the new digital economy and artificial intelligence and the impact that that's going to have on the economy and jobs and careers, presents a binary picture, it's good or bad. Uh, whereas the realism is the world is a shade of gray. Um, and as many jobs as we're going to lose through the new economy and working digitally, uh, many more jobs are going to be created, but they're perhaps going to be slightly different and require different skills. So I think it fits in well with the concept of, of lifelong learning and lifelong career development. It's a bit unrealistic to enter a career at the age of 18 or 19 and expect to do that throughout the whole of one's working life. I think we've got to be smart. And just as the speed of economic change is ramping up, we've probably also got to recognize that we're gonna to have to change our jobs and careers throughout our working life to keep a pace with that change. So the reality for many people is that yes, they are going to have to upskill throughout their working lives. And sadly, although some young people leave school thinking, that's it, school is over, I don't have to do any more learning, that is just not going to be the case going forward. We're all going to be learning increasingly, taking on new skills and new ways of working throughout our lives to keep ourselves economically effective, I think. So yes, there is a lot of talk about the new economy, which will require new skills, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that there's no such thing as a job for life. And we're all going to have to keep rapidly um, learning new skills and changing in our own careers. And I think even career professionals are a good example of that. My career started out in one way, doing one to one guidance. But I'm so passionate about the sector, I've kept my career in the career sector, doing many different types of jobs. I've had to learn new skills along the way. I went back to university for a year and did a master's degree when uh, 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 just before I was um, started to work for myself. So all the way through the, my career, I've been changing and morphing as opportunities change and, and come up. So I think the canny individual is going to be doing that too, going forward. So the new economy will bring forward new skills and people will change and grow and adapt because that's what they'll have to do as the economy goes forward. I think Does that this brings, sense? yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And it takes us back to the, the word you used at the beginning. I think you said it was a process. So yeah. it's not like we get a job and settle in. It's it's a process and we have to continue um, professionally developing to get to. And that's our responsibility. Careers development is an individual responsibility too, as well as looking for support externally. It's up to all of us, whatever our backgrounds, to plan and develop those career management skills that will see and support us throughout our working lives. And that's a lot of the work that career development professionals are trying to do. It's not just about employability skills, but it's also about supporting people to develop their own career management skills that they'll use throughout their lives. I'm very happy that you brought that up because there is still that thought in that career guidance or career development is all about finding the next job. But like you said, we are helping you develop skills as well and, and move mm -hmm. forward in your career. Um, I've got one last question for you uh, and it is about your recent position with QDIS Education. I just wanna say a little bit about it. It is an innovative organization that is introducing a new concept in the career education services industry in the UK. So 
So uh, it would be cool for you to share with us uh, what drew you to QDOS education and what are you hoping to achieve by taking on this role? Well, thank you. It's my current soapbox subject, so I can talk for a long time on this one. Um, what I like about what I'm doing now is it really is the private sector supporting public sector and public service. So um, QDOS Education is uh, part of a property management group, which some career professionals will scratch their heads and say, property management? What's that got to do with career development? Well, if I say the ambition of QDOS Education is to build 160 QDOS career hubs in, in England over the next five years, that will help to make some of the join up between the concept of a, a building company and career development. Uh, and the building company I'm working for is looking to create a legacy, really. They, they're very expert in building design, very modern design. But they also recognize the problems in the labor market because they are working construction and how difficult it is to get skilled uh, workers, bricklayers, joiners, metal workers, electricians, all those skilled craft careers. So what we're aiming to do through QDOS Education is establish place and space that will be devoted to career guidance activities. And that's what the hubs are about. Uh, and we are working particularly in areas of deprivation in England at the moment to establish these new QDOS hubs, which will house career development professionals, career advisors, who will be there to provide both career education, so taught sessions around career education activities and concepts of employability and career management, if you like, but very much involving employers in the process, because I see the hubs as a sort of uh, part of the pipeline, if you like, for supporting people into work and into new jobs. So people will be able to use the hubs, adults and young people, because we support that concept of lifelong career development, to come in, take part in any of the sessions we're running um, it, along the lines of employability skills and career management skills, but also if they wish to have individual career guidance sessions as well with qualified practitioners to help them on those career journeys. So it's, it's, a, new, it's a pretty unique idea. You can't have pretty unique, can you? It's unique or it's not unique. It's a unique idea in England at the moment that we are investing in that infrastructure that local authorities and central government at the moment cannot afford or have chosen not to invest in. Um, it's the, the investment is coming from the private sector and we are funding these new uh, career hubs for two years, by which time the aim is the sustainability element is that the partners working in the hub, the local authorities and the employers and the higher education institutions and the further education institutions and the adult education people will all come together and will continue to fund the ongoing revenue costs of the hubs after two years. So it's, it's a fantastic opportunity where a private sector uh, organization has said, we recognize the problem. We can see what you need is unique place and space for career guidance. There's nowhere where you can go in England at the moment to get that. So we will help pump prime the idea by establishing the centers. But after a few years, you'll have to find a way in each lo local area to continue the funding. So it's a really exciting project. And I've only been working with them since the beginning of June. We've got our planning permission for our first new career hub in the north of England um, and about 17 others in different stages of negotiation over land or going through planning permissions with local authorities and that sort of thing. So I'm really excited that over the next couple of years, we'll really be making a difference because my own personal mission, you having said I've been in the sector for 40 years, my, my personal mission now is to revolutionize how career guidance services are provided in England, um, a, a universal service that anybody can access because I just think it's so important 
to support people's lifelong career development? It is a unique project. Uh, and I am, um, I don't know, have you gotten into the details? Like, would anyone just be out of a job can come in? Is that the plan or? Yes, yes. During the day, um, we will be running sessions for schools. So schools will be able to bus young people in, in year groups or class sizes. Um, in the evenings, I want the hubs to be open some evenings every week because that makes them more accessible for adults but also so we can run career clubs in the evenings for young people. Uh, I'd like them to be open for the weekend for some of the days, but importantly in what has traditionally been the school holidays, because in England we have a very education-based model of career guidance. You can get it when you're in school, you can't get it when you're not. Uh, and it's not easy to access when you're not in school. So we want this to be a service that's there for the community, for adults and young people to make use of. But really important are the strong links with employers, because it's that the, the chain is that we will be providing and contributing to the pipeline of informed employees, really, for the future, an informed workforce for the future. Well, I am super excited by this project. I will be watching it and see how it develops because I would say as uh, employers, they would want to be involved so that you know they would get the right skills right away from employees. So very exciting project. Uh, and I can't wait to see how it evolves and maybe take it globally after that, <laughs> Jan. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, these are all the questions I've had for you today prepared. Was there anything else you would like to add or you were hoping I would ask you about, but I didn't? No, no, I think that's been great. And it's a, a sort of overview of the things I've done in my life to try and make a difference as a career practitioner. Um, and I'm very keen to keep doing that. And what a role model you are. I hope any, everyone listening will pick up on some of these uh, roles that you have taken and get passionate about, uh, about career development. Thank you so much for your time, Jan. Thank you. Thank you for joining me and Jan Alice in this first episode of Huda's Career Info 2022. Jan Alice shared an overview of what she has done as a career practitioner and of the different roles she took on. Please share in the comments section which role stood out as the most relevant to you as a career practitioner or a job seeker. You can connect with Jan Alice on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Please remember that you can listen to Huda's Career Info since it's also dropped as a podcast. To let me know if you or anyone you know works in the career field is and interested in an opportunity to talk about your experience, you can send me a direct message on my website, writecareerfit.com, where you can also sign up for my newsletter and stay up to date on the latest episodes. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and follow me on social media. I am your host, Hoda, and until next time... Stay focused and keep moving in productive ways.